So it's really terrific to be here. I love the future, and I love exponentials, and so uh, why not? Uh, we're here. And uh, this is my conflict of interest slide. Um, <laughs> and my point about exponentials is a little bit different than the party line here. It's that these are trend lines. They are not laws, even though called Moore's Law. And so when we ask, how long would it take to go from a $3 billion genome to an affordable one, which we'll say is somewhere less than $1,000, it could be that the market, uh, that there was no market. There, probably nobody in this room has their genome sequenced. How many people have their genome sequenced? Really sequenced. Okay. See, no market. Okay. And, and so it could have flatlined after the genome project ended, or it could have kept on the line. It was remarkably on the same line as the electronics Moore's Law, and it could have stayed on that line in case six decades. This is what actually happened. Instead of six decades, it was six years. And that didn't just happen automatically. The point is these are not laws. It requires effort. And, uh, and my team was part of a lot of different next generation sequencing that resulted in this effort. Now, it's not just the um, cost that has been on an exponential, and that exponential is six times Moore's Law, but the error rate and getting information over long distances have both improved, and their slope has changed. So these are factors of 10 on the y-axis. So that means they're not only exponential, they're getting faster, just like the cost. It's getting faster. Uh, and this is, these are all uh, biological uh, uh, breakthroughs. And so now the, the accuracy is close to one error in a billion. It's close to one error in a genome. This is really remarkable. It was around 0.3% uh, or, or worse when I started. Um, and it's important to have high quality genomes for clinical and for research. It, you can't just take uh, SNP chips or exomes, if you know, know the jargon, uh, if you have an inversion or translocation in, the, in between the coding regions, you're going to disrupt that gene. So it's very important to be able to handle inversions, translocations. Some people say the killer app for personalized medicine or personalized health or something is pharmacogenetics. I'm not going to be that, the person that says that. Uh, I'm not going to deny it either. Uh, but, but let's think about it a different way, which is the reason we need the far small molecule drugs in the first place is because we are biologically messed up. Uh, so for example, if we have the factor V Leiden, so factor V gene, the Leiden allele, the variant, um, then we have hypercoagulability. We have a clotting disorder. And so we might need warfarin. Warfarin is rat poison, and you've probably heard about it before. But you can titrate it, and you can, you, can, uh, you can either titrate it as a human test tube, or you can do it based on genetics. But the point is, if we didn't have the, the genetic problem, we wouldn't need to uh, mess around with rat poison. So what hope is there for changing the title of this is we can change not our environment, as, uh, as David did. He, he stopped eating those big, gigantic fish um, whole. Um, but you can also change your genetics. You can change your child's genetics, and you can change your own adult genetics, as we'll come to at the end. Now, this is an example of, of one of the companies that uh, one of my students uh, started, actually is a, is in the middle of graduate school, he just did this in his spare time, called Good Start Genetics. And they, they offer these tests, you know, dozens of tests. There could be hundreds or even thousands of tests that are predictive and medically actionable. We're not talking about the things that David said he wasn't sure whether they work or not. That, that's what you'll kind of hear a lot these days. But there are plenty of medical tests that are highly predictive and medically actionable. And here are some examples. Tay-Sachs is something you don't particularly want to have or you don't want your children to have, your family to have. And so uh, I'm, I'm one quarter Ashkenazi. And this, and this is a long list of things that, that I should have gotten uh, tested for if this technology was in good shape uh, when I was um, um, making babies, uh, or singular. Now the thing is, this is not, uh, it gives the false impression that you need to be of a certain ethnic group for this test to be useful for you. Anybody on the planet can have be a carrier for the Tay-Sachs disease and have a kid who will die by the age of four or some of these things are the age of, uh, you know, at, at birth. Um, 
you, you have, so, so the question is, and I'm gonna, it's going to be art of this participation in a moment, is, is what price do you put on that kind of information? Everybody's saying, oh, the genome's too expensive. I agree. When it was $3 billion, definitely. But now that it's getting down below $1,000, is it really too expensive to find out? Because are you sure that you don't have Tay-Sachs? Are you sure that you don't have some adult onset uh, disease? And so I'm going to put the, the question to you. This is somewhat analogous to the question that David asked. Um, if you could get your genome sequenced or somebody in your family and you could only pay attention, and this is a fairly trivial thing, only pay attention to things that are highly predictive and medically actionable, and this is, these are known, so, and it was some small dollar amount, you know, less than 1,000, less than 20, whatever your dollar amount is, would you get your genome sequenced? So show of hands. A much larger number than actually have their genome sequenced. So, interesting. Genomes, environments, and traits. David has already introduced this concept, and the point is where the objective of the now million times cheaper genome that we have in the last six years is not to go from genomes to straight to traits without anything in between. Uh, we have this personal genome project, personalgenomes.org, that is the world's only open source at <coughs> for genomes, environments, and traits. That may sound shocking to you, but worldwide there's only one. Of, it's now spreading to multiple countries, but there's no other game in town as far as we know. I'd be happy to hear uh, other examples. But the idea is to fill in the middle. Much of the middle here, which is the environmental components, some of which um, you can detect as uh, Larry mentioned, by me measuring your microbiome. He didn't mention, but we also do it for our personal genome project, measure mi the immune response, your immune response to your microbiome, to plants, to, uh, you know, to, you know, to various allergens, um, to yourself. Uh, and you can detect your interaction with chemicals and nutrition via so-called epigenome, the way that determines your development and aging and your response to environment. So all of this is now cheaper by a million fold. This is highly participatory. We have an annual uh, meeting around DNA Day, which is April 25th every year for many years now. Uh, Esther and David are members of this uh, project. Um, and you can see a lot of people show up and clearly they are de-identified. Uh, more about that in a moment. Re-identified, identified, all of the above. These are some of the things we do. Uh, they're just a tiny subset, ranging all the way from the very high level, whole organism, whole, whole person uh, trait assessments. This is functional magnetic resonance imaging on, on the far right there. Um, these, are, these are slices through, through my brain, fortunately virtual slices, not actual slices. Um, and then these are reprogrammed cells that were derived from my skin and then turned into very complex tissues in either a teratoma model or uh, in a tissue culture model. We'll more about that in a moment. The point is that these, uh, this is an amazing cohort, very highly participatory and excited. They got 100% on the exam, and that exam is to make sure they know what they're getting into, and we want to educate them first rather than saying, either saying, we're not going to tell you if we could save your life, or we're not going to, uh, or tell you when you don't want to know. Um, like many other, I'm not going to go through all the things that, that, uh, that you can do with wireless and other recording devices. We've heard some of that. The point is we want to integrate these with all the genomics, which is now a million times cheaper, um, and, and make a data set that is really big data on individuals. Here's examples of real people. You can see their names there. Not all of them are in the PGP. Uh, but the point is that people and families feel that it's more important to get at the bottom of what the disease is going on in their family than to uh, hide behind anonymity. And also more importantly is they're not getting to the bottom of their disease with conventional medicine. In each of these cases, in desperation, they sequenced their genome or the genome of their child or the genome of their cancer. I'm just going to talk about one of them. Uh, John Lowerman um, is a journalist, he's in the Personal Genome Project, he presented as healthy, but if you look at his medical records, which are publicly available, 
Uh, you can see he, did, he was hospitalized for, for leg pain and for scotomas, little black spots in his uh, retina. And the, and the leg pain, oddly enough, they did a genetic test that, the way they used to do it, even still do it, which is to guess the gene. They guessed the gene wrong. They f guessed factor V Leiden. That wasn't his problem. We did the whole genome. It turned out that JAK2 was a problem, and aspirin, uh, baby aspirin, was the solution. Not such a bad solution. Some of these others um, have to uh, get, <coughs> get parts of their body removed pre preventatively. Now, every, so on the subject of aging research, if we are prepared to make a breakthrough, which I think we are, uh, not just some of the ones we've heard here, Calico and so forth, but uh, every month we delay, four million of us die. I don't think those four million would want to commit suicide, but they, they die every month we delay. There is a study that studies people that are over 110 years old, uh, collected many of these now, androcyte, um, and what we're interested in is those, the extremes on the bell curve, because that's, at the extremes, it becomes actually relatively easy to recognize things from the, uh, the genome sequence. Now, the point is, these four people are over 110 years old when this picture was taken. And the point is not that you should rush out and start smoking and drinking to excess, uh, although feel free. Uh, it's that they have normal environmental issues the same as all of us do, maybe slightly worse environmental issues because their idea of protecting themselves from the environment, those ideas were formed a century ago with, where we had slightly different views. But they, we feel that they had rare protective alleles. Now, we're just, just in the process of sequencing their genomes, and so it's too early to say what those rare protective alleles are. But I'm going to give you a couple examples of rare protective alleles and then how we can get those rare protective alleles out to uh, regular people that don't have them. So here's an example uh, where instead of large cohorts, sometimes you have to study very small cohorts. These are N of 1. That is to say there's one person on the planet so far that has a myostatin double null, and one person on the planet has a myostatin receptor double null. And so you can't get thousands of these individuals, but you can uh, prove causality in, in two broad ways. One of them is by making animals that have the same mutation. And you can see that this one causes heavy muscling and very lean muscles and, in, and uh, decreased atherosclerosis. Not that any of you would be interested in any of these traits, but uh, cows, dog, and mice. So this is very likely causal. Cause and effect is established. And there are more, not just the myostatin MSTN, but LRP5, there are alleles of this. That was a myostatin was a double null, but LRP5 is a heterozygote. Specific alleles that cause your bones to be so, you know, 10, or, 10 standard deviations out beyond the, the mean, they will uh, damage surgical drill bits in saws um, and sink uh, when they swim. Um, PCSK9 is, is, a, is, is it, you can basically draw a straight line through LDL cholesterol and as you get closer and closer to zero, you have essentially better and better coronary artery disease. And this was only, this was an unexpected result of finding people out there with very low uh, LDL cholesterol genetically. Now, CCR5 and FUT2 are the receptors for, for HIV and uh, norovirus, respectively, and they are, um, if you delete them, there are people walking around that don't have them at all, and they don't get these viruses. And more about that in a moment. And then you can have protective alleles from Alzheimer's, just like you have alleles that put you at risk that are rare, you have, or common, you have ones that are rare, very rare that are protecting you. Now, there are gene therapies. This is how you can change your genetics. There are gene therapies. This had a rocky start 10 years ago, but now it's back in force, and you're going to see more of it. These are in phase two, one, two, three, four. Phase four means it's out there on the market. Glybera is on the market in Europe, the, the home of GMOs, um, has uh, a, a genetic uh, modified humans wandering around. 1,970 of these clinical trials, that's a lot uh, in gene therapy. And the next revolution is not just putting in genes to fix rare missing genes, 
but being able to precisely remove or replace and make very precise changes. And I'll show you how that works in just a moment. So that's the next thing, and here's an example. Mentioned already CCR5, they're, they're people that naturally have this. They're relatively rare, and in fact, they're almost missing in some populations. But if you have bo you're missing both, you, you don't, uh, your T cells do not take up the HIV virus, you don't have AIDS. And so patients that have full-blown AIDS are in these phase two clinical trials from Sangamo, where you have these zinc fingers. You have to have eight fingers in order to bring in a, these bacterial nuclease domains in the middle and cleave and make, you basically make a, a cleavage in the middle of the CCR5 gene. You have to get rid of both copies, both the copy you got from your mother and your father. And you, when you make that double null, they are now uh, cured of AIDS. Um, it's not a matter of drugs or vaccines, which don't work so well. The next step, so that was uh, zinc finger nucleases, but there, there are seven different ways of doing this gene targeting. I'm, just, I'm not going to go through the technical detail, but I want you, or unless you want to ask questions, but CRISPR is the word you should remember. It's like from the graduate, you were supposed to remember the word plastics. Well, from this meeting, CRISPR, okay? And we're using CRISPR to, to modify the organs on chips that, uh, that our collaborators, Kit Parker and Don Ingber, have, have developed and others. Um, almost every interesting organ is now represented uh, in mechanically and uh, multicellular uh, precision. And you can simulate uh, organs for uh, drug trial and for testing transplantation. You can customize them for individual uh, diseases, as I'll show in just a moment. So here's, uh, on the left, uh, artificial cerebral uh, components, uh, human uh, brain, essentially. And you can replicate uh, normal versus microcephalic uh, mutations. And then on the right uh, are cardiac muscle, which have been developed. These have been developed from skin cells and my, my skin cells and patient skin cells, and we can either take my cells and turn them into having the patient mutation or take the patient mutation and, and correct it. And so you can see on the right is a, is a messed up, highly disordered version of the cardiac muscle. And these will actually contract uh, in a rhythmic way, representing diastole and systole in, uh, in, in these uh, organoids on chips. Now, this is, not, uh, this is not a 3D printing, by the way. This is... Uh, developmental biology. In a way, it's, it's, it's uh, faster and more precise, uh, or at least it has that possibility. Here's an example of how fast it can be. We can, get, we can go from stem cells derived from skin cells to these bipolar neurons in uh, four days where nearly 100% of the culture converts from, from embryo-like cells into mature um, neurons, which, and these neurons have electrical activity, and I'm going to end by just thanking uh, members of the Personal Genome Project, uh, including the directors and staff. So thank you very much.